Welcome back. So we're talking a lot about how to model dynamical systems using modern tools in machine learning. And so I want to tell you about a really cool uh, kind of perspective on how to model systems with, with machine learning uh, called discrepancy modeling. So oftentimes when, you know, when we're trying to use some new machine learning technique to show that we can learn dynamical systems, you know, learn how a system evolves in time, learn a turbulent fluid system or something like that, we do an end-to-end -end learning. We act like we don't know anything about our system and we try to learn everything from scratch. And that's kind of cool to demonstrate capabilities, to demonstrate that you can learn these complex systems. But instead of trying to discover a model from scratch with no prior knowledge, it's much more realistic that you would start with some partial knowledge of the physics. Maybe you have an idealized model, like a Hamiltonian or, or Lagrangian for you know, a double pendulum or for an automobile, an autonomous vehicle. Maybe you know something about constraints that have to be satisfied or symmetries, conservation laws for your system. And you don't know the exact dynamics, but you have this kind of partial physical knowledge that you are starting with. And so instead of uh, discovering the model from scratch with machine learning, I think it's much more reasonable oftentimes to try to learn. So you start with this imperfect model, and you might want to focus your machine learning efforts in modeling the discrepancy, the part of your model that doesn't fit your data. Okay, That's, I think, uh, a more realistic way of how we might approach autonomous systems and robots. Uh, learning fast and on the fly is starting with an imperfect or idealized model and then focusing the machine learning uh, effort on the discrepancy. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how you might do that uh, and also talk about kind of a little bit more almost of the philosophy of when you would want to learn end to end, when you would want your machine learning models to capture that discrepancy, uh, and when you wouldn't. And this will have some kind of historical connotations with things like, you know, uh, the universal law of gravity and things like that. So here's an example I really like uh, by Kadir Dan Kamen, who is a PhD student working with Nathan Kutz and me. And this is a double pendulum apparatus in my lab in mechanical engineering at University of Washington. And you can see, so this, uh, this setup here, what he's trying to do is swing it up and stabilize this inverted double pendulum which is a relatively simple mechanical system. You know, on a piece of paper, you can derive uh, the Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian, and you can derive the equations of motion you know, from those, those frameworks. But it turns out that when you use that idealized Hamiltonian or Lagrangian model for control design, there are imperfections in that model that make it very hard to accurately and efficiently swing up and stabilize the system. So what do those imperfections look like? Things like uh, nonlinear bearing chatter in the joints or wind resistance. Those are things that we typically don't model in our first principles physics, uh, or at least it's difficult to do so. But when you include a discrepancy model using kind of machine learning techniques, when you, when you model the discrepancy of your idealized model with the experimental data, you can start capturing those subtle effects in, uh, in this discrepancy model, and then you can do pretty remarkable control uh, tasks like swing up and stabilize this double pendulum. I just love this video. I'm going to keep showing it because it's it's awesome. Uh, he this is the old rig. This is the um, the original rig uh, that Ben Strom started building, and uh, now Cardi has a new triple pendulum setup. Uh, fancy new rig. It's more expensive than my car, uh, and hopefully I'll show you a video of that sometime soon. But it's super cool. Okay, so that's the idea of discrepancy modeling, though. You want to augment your idealized model with all of the terms and really subtle physics like wind resistance and bearing chatter that are hard to model uh, from first principles. And so we can kind of look at this on two axes, uh, going from easy to hard. So on the x-axis, what you have is uh, modeling disturbances and unknown physics. So this is where you know, your, your bearing chatter and your wind resistance comes in. And it's very difficult to model those with uh, first principles physics, you know, pencil and paper, textbook physics. It's hard to model uh, bearing chatter and wind resistance, for example. And on the other axis, you have uh, how difficult is it to incorporate known physics. So for example, in that double pendulum, I know 
that there are you know these constraints that my system is constrained uh, to be you know in angular coordinates theta one and theta two. I could write it in x one x two or sorry x x y coordinates and Cartesian coordinates, but I would need to know that that system enforces some constraints these these bearing constraints, and that's actually oftentimes very hard for machine learning to learn. It's hard to learn that the Hamiltonian energy is conserved or that my system is constrained to live on a circle or uh, some toroidal configuration space. And so I think this is a really interesting uh, kind of set of axes to show why you want these hybrid discrepancy models. There's some things that are easy uh, for machine learning to do, like they can learn those bearing chatter and, and wind resistance models just by collecting data. The first principles models can learn that the Hamiltonian energy should be conserved and that the system is constrained to live on a torus. And so you wanna get the best of both worlds. You don't wanna do everything with first principles or everything with machine learning. You wanna find some sweet spot in the middle between these where you're getting the best of both worlds. And hopefully this curve actually is more like a Pareto optimal curve where there's kind of an optimal elbow here where our discrepancy models live. We get as much as we can with the first principles and we bake in as much prior knowledge as we can. And then everything that our first principles model can't uh, capture like that wind resistance, we're gonna model that discrepancy with machine learning. And that machine learning could be anything. It could be a deep neural network, it could be a dynamic mode decomposition model, uh, sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics, a Gaussian process model. You know, this is not just a deep neural network, um, but it's something that is kind of data uh, intensive or data informed model. Okay, that, that's what I think of as machine learning. So this is a sweet spot where you get the best of both worlds. And you can apply this to lots of systems. So I showed you that uh, swing up of the double pendulum. Uh, this is a robotic arm in our Boeing Advanced Research Center or BARC. Um, this system, you know, again, it has, as this system ages, the way that the joints move and the way that the motors behave changes in time. And so these discrepancy models can also be very important when you're building digital twins. Uh, and you want to incorporate things like aging or you know different environments, things like that. Good. Uh, so just to kind of very, very briefly summarize, this idea is that you're going to kind of use first principles physics where it's good, you know, here in our imperfect model, to enforce things like constraints and conservation laws and symmetries. And we're going to use machine learning for what it's good at, which is you know modeling the really hairy, hard to quantify bits from data. And you're gonna put those together and hopefully get something that's easy to train and satisfies uh, kind of your rudimentary physics. Okay, um, now I, at this point, you know, that's the, the kind of guts of the idea, but I wanna pull back and talk a little bit about how this has historically uh, manifest itself and some of the key takeaways and caveats we uh, as engineers can, can learn about how and when we should apply machine learning to model dynamical systems and what might go wrong. So uh, I show this movie sometimes, I really like this visualization uh, by Malin Christensen, which shows kind of the difference between these two worldviews of the Earth-centric solar system and the Sun-centric solar system. And you can see, of course, that um, if you put the Earth at the center of the solar system, which is what people thought for you know, a thousand plus years, the dynamics are very, very complicated. Okay? It's hard to get a simple idealized model that describes uh, this behavior here. And it's much simpler to get uh, a simple model when you have the right coordinate system. But what I want to point out here is that you know, it took a long time for us to go from the Aristotelian model uh, of, I'm sorry, the, the Ptolemaic, Ptolemy's uh, model of circles on circles in the, the Earth-centric system to Kepler's uh, laws of motion here in the Sun-centric system, in this Copernican system. And what I'll point out is that Ptolemy's system, which is in the wrong coordinate system, it's the wrong physics, it was actually more accurate <laughs> Uh, for a long time than Kepler's model that had the right physics, that had the sun at the center of the solar system. And so to some extent, there were these discrepancies, uh, unmeasured variables, planets we didn't know about yet, uh, and forces that we couldn't predict that made it so that Kepler's actual correct uh, idealized physics model was not as good of a fit as Ptolemy's model. 
And I think that this is a really important point for us as machine learning engineers. When we learn dynamical systems, it's easy to overfit uh, to the data. The, the Ptolemaic model is essentially a Fourier transform of the solar system data, and it was extremely accurate, more accurate uh, than, than the right model because there were discrepancies, because there were planets that hadn't been measured. And so you have to think about, you know, kind of what core bits you're trying to, to measure and model. Okay, another example I really like to think about is uh, Galileo's ball drop experiment. So, you know, in some sense, Galileo and, and this famous ball drop experiment, you know, where he dropped two balls of different densities and they fell at the same rate and they hit the ground at the same time, this is a very well-crafted uh, experiment, and I think that there's a lot of kind of historical uh, kind of retellings or, or, or small fictions that, that go on with this story. So if you look at Galileo's ball drop experiment, this is essentially supposed to prove that there is a universal uh, kind of law of gravitation, a gravitational constant, and that objects fall at the same rate regardless of their densities. But we know that that's not entirely true. All of us, you know, if you dropped a beach ball uh, and a bowling ball, they do fall at different rates because there are these additional forces. It's not just gravity acting on, on those objects. You also have fluid forces. You have drag forces, uh, viscous drag forces and, and uh, you know, turbulent forces on those different objects. And so, you know, for example, if you increase the velocity of a falling object, you go through all of these different drag regimes as the fluid forces change and bifurcate according to very, very complicated physics. And so to some extent, uh, you know, Galileo's ball drop experiment trying to say that these balls fall at exactly the same rate because there is one, you know, constant uh, acceleration of gravity, that is neglecting a bunch of discrepancy physics. <laughs> there are discrepancies in those ball drops uh, that is not captured by the model, and you have to ignore those if you want to uncover that kind of, you know, constant acceleration of gravity. And in fact, Galileo did not just discover this by dropping balls off of, you know, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. He did very uh, careful experiments. So, sorry, let me take a step back. If you actually collected data and you were you know, not dropping dense balls, but you were dropping beach balls and basketballs and wiffle balls and golf balls, you would very likely not come up with Galileo's uh, constant acceleration. It's much more likely you would come up with Aristotle's model that uh, the rate at which a ball falls or, or moves through the air is somehow proportional to its mass or its density. That actually seems very consistent. If I throw a baseball, it's gonna go way farther than if I throw a beach ball because the drag of that beach ball is somehow related to its density, okay? And so, you know, this was the leading model for, again, over a thousand years because it fit the data better. And so to some extent, you have to kind of divorce the discrepancies and the different types of physical forces that are at play in a system if you want to uncover kind of the universal idealized model, which is what Galileo did. And, you know, in some sense, what Galileo did was not just drop balls off of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. He also did other very careful experiments looking at how pendula oscillated in very controlled still environments and looking at how balls would roll down ramps of different inclines so he could control the kind of drag forces and those discrepancies and control for those additional effects, okay? And I think this is an extremely important uh, cautionary tale, again, for us as machine learning uh, engineers. When we have a new system like, you know, we're trying to learn how balls move, you know, or, or fall through the air and we want to learn the physics, chances are much more likely that we're gonna learn Aristotle's model, uh, which is not kind of the, the true underlying physics, because it is a better fit to the data because of those discrepancy terms, because of the, the complexity of the real world and fluid drag forces. And so that's a really important philosophical question you have to ask yourself. Which one do I wanna learn? It's, it's a fair question. Do I wanna learn, you know, that there is a constant acceleration of gravity and all balls should fall at the same rate in a you know, perfect world? Or do I wanna learn the full hairy turbulent drag physics and get a more accurate model of how real balls would fall? That's a fair question. Um, and in different circumstances, you would wanna learn different models. So you have to keep that in mind. 
And so uh, there's a set of experiments that were conducted. Um, this is work with Brian De Silva when he was a PhD student with Nathan Kutz and myself. And uh, some of Nathan's collaborators essentially did this experiment. They took all of these different balls and they dropped them from, uh, I think it was you know, the, the roof of a five-story parking garage. And they, they watched and tracked their motion as they fell to the ground. So you have golf balls, uh, tennis balls, baseballs, wiffle balls, basketballs, okay? All different densities, all different uh, kind of drag profiles. And so if you look at the data, this is kind of, you know, the height, uh, and this is uh, strobostop, stroboscopic uh, measurements as they fell uh, from, you know, whatever, 40 meters down, you see that they all fall at different rates. Again, the, the actual raw data is more like the Aristotelian model uh, that it somehow depends on their density. And if you plot kind of the height over time, you see that they all take different trajectories uh, and these dashed lines are kind of different models of the physics. So this is the idealized gravity with no, uh, no friction. And then the uh, kind of white and yellow dashed lines are having some uh, velocity-based drag model. And again, this is just that same data on a log plot. So you see that the data doesn't actually support uh, just one of these models, right? Like it's all over the place. And so, you know, we can do a number of experiments. This was uh, using our sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics algorithm, where you put in a candidate set of terms that could describe the acceleration. And just with regression, you try to see which terms best describe the data. And for these different balls over you know, multiple drops, you get different terms showing up and disappearing. You, know, you get spurious term, this x should not be there, this v squared shouldn't be there. You know, so this is the wrong physics according to Galileo. Now, if you add a group sparsity penalty, so what you say is that the same physics has to be true, the same terms have to be there for all of the balls across all the drops. If you add group sparsity, you then kind of rule out all of those spurious terms and you learn the actual dynamics that uh, x double dot, the acceleration, is equal to a constant of magnitude 9.8, right, gravity. And there is a uh, kind of drag or a dissipation term that's proportional to its velocity. That's the very, very simple velocity-based drag model. And so, again, great care has to go into how you constrain your machine learning algorithm to learn the correct physics because the actual data, you know, doesn't support that. It says that there are uh, density dependent terms. There's other physics that's more likely to describe your data if you just look at, you know, a uh, wiffle ball falling. And so I just found this to be extremely uh, kind of enlightening for, for myself. I know we've talked about this a lot, um, you know, our group, and it really does start to beg the question, what kind of model do you want? Do you want a model that actually captures all of this variation between these different types of balls, that does have a density term in there and does capture that, you know, turbulent drag wake of these balls? Or do you want something more like Galileo's simple idealized physics? This is kind of related to that problem of discrepancy modeling and how you, uh, how you model and how you control your learning process. So really important idea, uh, you know, when you're modeling systems with machine learning to think about what kind, of, what kind of model do you want? Do you want an idealized model that you can analyze and learn from that, that kind of generalizes well? Or do you want a model that just with brute force fits your data more accurately? Do you want Galileo or do you want Aristotle? All right, thank you.